Everyone wants fire, financial independence, retire early, but few are on track for it. In Mech's latest series, Paycheck to Paycheck, we will explore the three critical dynamics for breaking the cycle of living paycheck to paycheck and how to experience true financial freedom. Well, welcome to Max Online Campus and welcome to a new year. Before we get started in our new series, a little couple of quick updates you might find of interest. Uh, last year, over 15,000 people joined us for our Christmas services through our online campus. This year, are you ready for this? Over 37,000 joined us online, just like you are joining us now through our online campus for Christmas. So um, we are saying a collective, yay God. As far as giving to Christ at Christmas, our annual offering and effort that we're doing uh, there to try to uh, extend the cause of Christ in so many different ways and also serve the poorest of the poor, uh, that money is still coming in. It will throughout January. A lot of people wait until January for you know, year-end bonuses and whatever and various things that come in in terms of their own uh, financial flow. But we have already exceeded all of last year's total giving which again is blowing us away. Because when, and, when, and here's what's so exciting for me, um, is that, is that you know, we, we, we never know what, you know, what God's gonna do through people's hearts and lives and generosity. And so we can only make tentative plans for all that we want to do and all that we can do and how we can best serve our partners and the degree to which we can serve our partners. An example would be, we're the sole financial supporters of an orphanage in Argentina. And one of the things when I was down visiting with them, uh, uh, summer before last, we began laying the plans for the possibility of expanding for them to include infants, uh, which they're not able to do right now. And so we've been working on that. And, and of course, they're saying things like, well, you know, are we going to be able to do this? And we say, we got to wait and see, you know, <laughs> how giving to Christ goes and, and that effort. And so um, I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to give them some positive news, I hope. And so, but anyway, uh, continue. If you haven't given yet, please do so. That's going to be wide open throughout the month of uh, January. It's not too late at all. In fact, we're still hoping that uh, uh, more will come in so that we can just begin to strategize with our partners and thinking through all the wonderful things that can be done with uh, your your generosity. So thank you for those of you who gave. For those of you who haven't, it's not too late. But I wanted to give an update that uh, you've already exceeded last year's total. And so, um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. So enough on that. Uh, as I said, welcome to a new year, which means welcome to New Year's resolutions, which according to a CBS poll, about one out of every three of us have made. So that is not fading in any way. A lot of us are still making New Year's resolutions. So those of us who did, what did we resolve to do or to be differently in 2024? Well, again, according to polls, we've got the top five. So let's do a rundown. Coming in at number five was losing weight. Number four was spending more time with family and friends. Uh, number three was to eat healthier. And number two was to exercise more. So already three of the top five are health related. Uh, so that's obviously big on our collective agendas or else over Christmas, we just got collectively as an agenda big. <laughs> I don't know. Ready for number one? Here it is. The number one resolution for 2024 made by a whopping 59% of those surveyed, nothing else even came close, was save more money. Which makes sense because like the title of this series, a lot of us are living paycheck to paycheck. And I do mean a lot of us, as in most of us. Even if we escaped living that way for a little while during the pandemic, which many of us did. I mean, a lot of people, the pandemic was kind of sweet financially. Uh, we were able to save money while we were stuck at home. We got stimulus checks we used to build up savings or chip away at debt. We got a, uh, many got a break from repaying student loans. But that all ended. <laughs> we went from record savings and margin to record debt in just two years. According to data gained by Payments.com and Lending Club, as of just last November, just a couple months ago, over 60% of Americans were living paycheck to paycheck. By paycheck to paycheck, I mean relying on your regular 
income, your paychecks to meet your expenses and financial obligations, but like nothing left over. Nothing left over, no margin, nothing for savings. I mean, you're living paycheck to paycheck. Now, we all know that as long as you keep getting that paycheck and nothing outside of your normal budget happens, you can survive that way. But if something unexpected happens, a medical bill, uh, transmission goes out in your car, uh, the need for emergency travel, I mean, there's a death or a illness in the family, uh, a broken air conditioning unit or you know heater goes out, you don't have the money to care for it. You'd have to borrow or go into debt to pay for it. But that's not the only downside of living paycheck to paycheck. It's also about what happens if you stop getting that paycheck. Uh, you get fired, you get laid off, you get hurt, and you can't work. When, um, when you're living paycheck to paycheck, if even one paycheck doesn't come, you're in trouble. And then there's what living this way prevents you from doing. Like, you know, saving up to buy a car or a house or preparing for retirement or even taking a vacation. There's just no upside to living this way. And when you break it down by generation, the largest group living this way are millennials. Now, millennials, you know, is people generally between the ages of, say, 27 and 42. 73%, almost three out of every four millennials, people in their late 20s to early 40s are living this way. And no matter what your age, by the way, if you're thinking, well, this, is this just a lower income thing or people who are just starting off in their careers and they haven't reached their earning potential? No matter what your age, uh, living this way is not a reflection of how much you make. More than 40% of consumers earning over $100,000 a year. And let me say that again. People are earning over $100,000 a year. 40% of them are living paycheck to paycheck, which means this isn't about the amount you make. It's about what you are making out of the amount. And that's what this series is going to be about. How to break free of living this way. And don't we all want that? I mean, right now, survey after survey, poll after poll, research project after research project is in completely, complete agreement about the number one cause of stress in our lives. It's financial pressure. Even among Gen Zers, the youngest generation, a, a time when you would think there would be Less financial stress in any other era because you have maybe fewer financial obligations. You're just starting off and all these kinds of things. You're not encumbered by children or whatever. 64% say that personal finance concerns are impacting their mental health more than anything else, more than concerns about climate change or geopolitical concerns or social problems. It's also one of the top causes of marital stress. And wouldn't you agree? I mean, I don't have to play that out anymore, do I? I mean, let's play an imagination game. If you were to rub a magic lantern uh, and have a genie appear and you were granted one wish that would free you in every possible way for the rest of your life, what would that wish be? And before you get cheeky and say, ask for more wishes, we'll eliminate that one. <laughs> would it be uh, getting fit, losing weight or eating better? Would it be reading a book a month? Would it be getting that degree? Would it be um, getting married, having children, owning a home, touring Europe? Uh, would any of those have the ripple effect of changing area after area of your life? Would that be your answer, any of those? I don't think so. I think for most people, if they could wish for one thing, they might say, uh, I'd like to win the, yep, lottery. Become financially free. And don't feel guilty if you feel that way. Most people would have their lives profoundly impacted if they could experience financial freedom. If they could get out of debt, if they could have more savings, if they could experience what flows into a life when generosity flows out, they would find it would change the quality of their family life. It would enhance their marriage. It would relieve untold amounts of anxiety. It would lift them out of states of depression, and it would enable them to expand their horizons and vision, whether through additional education or investments or starting their own business or traveling. Financial freedom would set off one of the biggest chain reactions imaginable in a person's life. Just think about family. I mean, just that one little narrow slice. A recent study found that the single factor that determined whether having a child would make you more happy or less happy was whether having that child would bring financial strain. 
Another study found that financial arguments early on in a marriage, whether related to financial stress or not agreeing on basic financial principles, are one of the prime indicators of eventual divorce. Well, let's dig into this and talk about how to relieve this area of anxiety for our life. And we're gonna let the wisdom of the Bible show us the way. Now, if that roadmap surprises you, you know, Bible, money management, Bible, you know, paycheck to paycheck, let me tell you something about the Bible and money that you may not have known. There are more verses in the Bible about money than there are about heaven and hell combined. Did you know that? Verses on money management and financial peace and financial freedom, on savings and debt, borrowing and lending, earning and investing. And there's a reason. God wants financial freedom for you. He doesn't want you to have anxiety. He doesn't want you to have stress. He doesn't want you to fear your final years on this planet, however long or short they might be in terms of retirement issues. He knows the role money plays in our lives. And he cares about us. And that's one of the reasons why there's so much in the Bible about money. So let's dig into how to break free of living paycheck to paycheck, beginning with a look at an overarching plan that we can have as a target on the wall. And then we're gonna start breaking down how to make that plan a reality. Okay, first the plan. Uh, it's called the 10 10 plan and it takes the Bible's teaching on financial freedom and organizes it in the simplest way possible. I try to teach on this regularly around here because I believe so strongly in how it serves marriages and families and individuals of any and every age. And I, But I've had too many people too, too many to count, who said to me, goodness gracious, I wish someone had told me this when I was back in my 20s. It would have revolutionized my life. The good news is it's never too late to start. It will serve you at any age whenever you want to begin. So I'm very committed to this, uh, but realize to my surprise that it's been four years since I've taught on this. So shame on me. So this will be a good reminder for all of us uh, who may have heard me teach on this before, four years ago, uh, but especially important for those who have never heard it. So it's called the 10 80 plan because through it, you take whatever you make and you manage it by putting 10% in one area, 10% in another area, and then 80% in a third, 10, 10, 80. And if you manage it this way, you both honor God and you gain all that honoring God brings and you achieve financial freedom and all that financial freedom brings. Here's how it works. You start off by taking the first 10% of everything you earn and you give it to God and his work through the local church of which you are connected. In Proverbs 3.9, the Bible says, honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income and he'll fill your barns with wheat and barley and overflow your wine vats with the finest wines. Now that first part called a tithe, which just simply means that's another word for 10%, is the start of the plan. With every paycheck you receive, every dollar you get, give 10% to God's work through the local church of which you consider yourself a part. And do it with trust in one simple fact. No matter how much it is, no matter how much it stretches your faith, you will never be able to out Give God. And, but don't do it for what you'll get. Do it because you know and love God. The Bible is not into legalism or guilt trips. In fact, here's how the Bible talks about it. It says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in a response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Now, quick time out. If that lost you, okay, or if you just feel like, oh, I just can't stand it when churches kind of talk like this or they teach on this, well, um, uh, you're not really into God. You're not, you know, much less a church. And 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 let me just let me just say this, okay, just to kind of give a little release button here. If neither God nor generosity matters to you, and I don't say that in a condescending or condemning way, I'm just trying to be blunt. If neither God nor generosity matters to you, skip this part. Skip it for now. Go to a 1090 plan. Don't do 101080, do a 1090 plan. Uh, now, I may come back and circle around at some point and challenge you to think a little bit about that, or at least think carefully about that before you go that route, but I get it, okay? I, I get it. Um, so the first 10 of the 101080 does depend 
on where you're at with God and where you're at with generosity. So we'll just leave it there. The second part of the 10 10 principle is to take another 10% and invest it in some type of long-term savings plan. In other words, with every paycheck, pay yourself. Now, in this category, the Bible doesn't specify a percentage like it does for giving, but most financial counselors would recommend the 10% figure. This can be a mutual fund, stocks, bonds, limited partnerships, pension funds, an IRA, matching what your employer puts into a 401k, uh, on and on it goes. This is different than saving for a new piece of furniture or your dream trip to Hawaii. This is about a long-term plan to get money working for you. Now, let me give you a sampling of what the Bible says about this from the book of Proverbs alone. And Proverbs is an Old Testament book in the Bible that's known as the great wisdom book of the Bible because it records the wisdom of Solomon who asked God for one gift, give him wisdom, and God did. And he recorded his wisdom in the book of Proverbs, so it's a fascinating book to read. But this is what, a little bit of what it says about uh, saving. It says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Proverbs 10, he who gathers crops in summer is prudent, but he who sleeps during harvest is disgraceful. And then in Proverbs 21, the wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. The Bible encourages us to save, and the reason is because of the future. It's not just about wealth building or affluence or materialistic gain. It's about security and providing for our needs, becoming our own bank, if you will. If we don't, we end up paycheck to paycheck. So what's the 80% for in the 10 10 80 plan? That's what you live on. You give 10% back to God, 10% into some type of long-term savings or investment plan, and then you use the final 80% for your actual living expenses. Now, let's put this plan into play and look at an example of a spending charge. First, you would write down your total income. I just made these figures up. Let's just say uh, your salary or your combined salary, if you're in a partnership or marriage, is $75,000. So plug that in. Next, you subtract how much you're going to give. Following the 10 10 80 plan on an income of $75,000, that would be 10% or 7500 Next, you need to subtract taxes. On a salary of $75,000, that would be anywhere from, what, 18 to 25%. So let's say taxes will be around $15,000. Next, subtract whatever debt repayment you have. This changes from person to person, so we'll just have to kind of plug in a number. So let's go with $7,500 a year. Next, subtract the amount you're going to invest in long-term savings. Following our plan, that would be 10%, so that'd be another $7,500. Now, after you subtracted your giving, your taxes, debt repayment, and savings, you have a figure that reflects how much you have to fund your lifestyle. In this case, it'd be $37,500. That's the 10 10 80 plan in action. Give first, save second, live on the rest. It really is that simple. But let me tell you what I've noticed is the natural tendency of most people, myself included, left unchecked. It's to do anything but this plan. <laughs> In fact, our natural tendency is just to flip it, to invert it, do the exact opposite. Let me show you what I mean. Let's go back to our chart and let's start off again with an income of 75,000. Then we start, we go next, listing, uh, listing what we want to do in terms of lifestyle. Instead of the bottom, that goes up at the top. And let's just say we don't want to live off $37,500. Let's say we want to live off $50,000 lifestyle. The house we want, the clothes we want to wear, how much we want to eat out, the number of tech toys we want to buy. Then we subtract the debt repayments needed to fund that lifestyle, which means that jumps from 7,500 to at least 10,000, maybe more, but we'll put in 10,000. Then we take out taxes because we have to. And then when it comes to savings, we, well, oops, <laughs> we've already spent our $75,000 salary. And giving, well, that's now a pipe dream. The exact opposite of God's plan, the exact opposite of freedom. Here's the point. Financial freedom doesn't begin with lifestyle. It begins with commitments and it begins with priorities. Beginning with the lifestyle you want just puts you into a cycle of debt. It shuts God out of the picture and it leaves you without any hope of breaking free. So the 10 10 80 plan, I, I'll admit, it calls for a radical rethinking of how you approach money. It, you know, it involves the head and the heart, lifestyle and discipline. 
It involves choice and decision, but it will bring you what you want most, freedom. Now, I know what you're thinking. 10% giving, 10% saving. I mean, I can't live off the 100% now. I mean, I am in debt up to my eyeballs. There's no way I can do this. This is already feeling defeating. I don't have the ability to even think about this plan. Remember, I'm already living paycheck to paycheck. Again, I get it. But you can't get out of that lifestyle without a target on the wall, without knowing kind of where it is you're trying to get to. So let's just have the 10, 10, 80 plan be the target on the wall. And now let's talk about taking first steps toward making it a reality. And here's where the Bible would start the conversation. It would say, let's start by getting out of debt. Let's just take that aspect of it, which is a good place to start. But when, because when it comes to debt, most of us are in it. Just take credit cards. At the end of September of last year, America's collective credit card balance was at a record $1.08 trillion. And that was before the holiday spending with an average interest rate of 21%. That's the highest interest rate in nearly three decades. At the credit counseling nonprofit um, Money Management International, the average new client, they said, comes in with 30000 nearly $30,000 in unsecured debt, and, which is basically a euphemism for credit card. And that usually, uh, and that was $20,000 at the start of 2022. So it increased $10,000 average in a year. If we could eliminate debt from our life, would that be a big step? toward breaking the cycle of living paycheck to paycheck and moving into more realistically a chance at a, a you know, shot at a 10 to 80 a plan? Well, we all know it would. And God does too. Here's a primer on what the Bible teaches in the book of Proverbs alone. It says, it's, or I mean, just uh, for example, in the book of Proverbs, it says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. In the book of Romans, it says, don't run up debts. Then from the teaching of Jesus came this money analogy. Don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? In other words, don't use debt to dig yourself into a hole. Now, does this mean that all debt, no matter how, you know, how much it is or what it's for, is bad? And the answer is no. Debt in general is frowned on in the Bible from a functional practical standpoint, but it doesn't prohibit it in each and every circumstance. Uh, in normal economic times, you can make a strong case, both financially and biblically, that accepting debt toward an appreciable asset, land, house, a building, or perhaps in connection with a well-thought-out business loan that provides you with some working capital to start a business, or maybe to fund an education in a career that would be far more lucrative than the one you're in now, is not only appropriate, but at times even strategic. But that's not the kind of debt most people are enslaved by. Most of us are drowning in consumer debt, lifestyle debt, debt for convenience and pleasure. And it promises to give us what we want, instant gratification without a downside, and it's an absolute lie. All it does is enslave us to a life of bondage. And you might be feeling it right now. Debt is eating up every available dollar you have that could go towards savings or could go toward generosity, that could go toward down payments on a house or form retirement. It's impacting your marriage, causing stress and friction. It's lowering your self-esteem. Every aspect of the quality of your life is being affected by this. You have become the servant, the slave of the lender, the slave to the creditor, the one in bondage to the debt that you carry. Now, most of you know this. But just in case you don't, <laughs> let me try to offer a stiff dose of reality, even a wake-up call. Just think about credit cards. Right now, interest rates are in the 20s, but if you have excellent credit, you can get around maybe an 18% interest rate. I ran an $8,000 balance through an 18% to 18% uh, interest rate and minimum payments, okay? So just as a kind of a fun exercise, $8,000 balance, 18% interest, minimum payments. How long do you think it would take to pay that $8,000 off? How long do you think that debt, if you had it, would plug your life, haunt your life, weigh your life down? How long would you be in bondage? Well, let me tell you. At that rate, it would take nearly 54 
years to pay it off. 54. <laughs> and get this, you would have paid with interest, not the 8,000 that you borrowed or you know got in debt, not 18,000, not even 28,000, but more than $30,000 total. That interest is nearly three times what you actually spent. And this is just credit card debt. We haven't even talked about the added enslavement that comes from what we carry on top of our credit cards. Consumer debt for furniture and appliances and TVs and cars and college loans and mortgages. This is why the Bible says, be so careful with debt. Not let it get big or out of hand. And not only that, but to lower it at all costs. Because it can and will enslave you. It's the opposite of financial freedom. It's the opposite of God's dream for your life. So how do we get out of it? Let me give you the simplest, I think most personally encouraging, satisfying you know, way around a plan every financial uh, counselor almost universally signs off on is one of the best ways to get out of debt. It's called the snowball plan. And here's how it works. First, let me just state the obvious, swear off adding to your debt. None of this is gonna be any use if you just keep using debt to live above your means. So that has to end. But then, here's what you do. Take all of your existing debts, from the MasterCards to the visas, mortgage payments to cars, college loans to furniture, TVs to refrigerators, and then rank them from the smallest balance, don't worry about interest rates or anything else, smallest balance to the largest balance. Again, balances, not interest payments, not even the um, uh, interest rates or payments. Balance. And let me show you what that might look like. I totally just made these figures up, but just to kind of be a composite person, uh, just to make a point. Some of you might need a one, two, or three added in front of some of these balances, but let's just use this uh, to play with. Once you got your list, start off with your smallest balance and tackle it first. Here would be the gas card where $400 is your balance, $60 is your minimum payment. Work on paying it off. Don't worry about the others, just make minimum payments on those. Start with your smallest balance and get aggressive with it and it alone. Put everything you can toward it until it's gone. If you get a little raise this year, up your payment from the minimum of 2% to 3% or four. If you get a tax rebate, use that. If you get any windfall of any kind, some birthday money, Christmas money, put it toward it. Have a yard sale, put that money toward it. Take everything you can and put all your energies toward paying that one bill off. Then, when it's gone, and it'll go away pretty fast because it was your smallest balance, uh, and you're putting all of your effort toward it. So it'll go pretty fast, which is why it's so encouraging. It's like, wow, I already got one gone. Then take what you were paying toward it and instantly put it toward the next smallest balance and then make that your concentration. Let's go back to our list of bills. You paid off your gas card, which was $60 a month. Here's where it gets fun. Now you take that 60, you add it to the next biggest, which is your MasterCard. You were paying $70 a month minimum on that, but now you add the 60 to it and you're paying 130. That's almost double what you were paying before. And you keep paying that 130 until it's gone. And then you take that 130, which was the 60 you were paying toward the gas card and the 70 you were already paying toward the MasterCard, and you add it to the next biggest, which is your Visa. You were paying 200 a month on that. Now you can pay $330 a month toward that. You see, the more you do this, the bigger and faster it goes. That's why it's called the snowball plan because what you pay debt, you, toward debt keeps getting bigger as you eliminate previous debts, like a snowball that starts to go down a hill, gets bigger and bigger and faster and faster. And then by the time you get to something big, like a student loan or a car or a house, you're paying a lot of money toward it. So it's a little slow at first, not too bad because you're tackling your smallest, but then it builds with unbelievable speed toward getting completely out of debt. And be encouraged, most people overestimate what they can do in a year, but they underestimate what they can achieve in three. Now, this is just the first installment, okay, as we start this conversation, in breaking the paycheck to paycheck cycle. We've got two more installments, and they are absolutely critical. This is not, you know, each one of these is not really in a silo. They all three hang together. So this is just the first step, but you can do this if you want. The key dynamic about New Year's resolutions isn't about it being a new year. It's about it being a resolution. That's the idea, the idea of resolve. 
You know, there's just a lot of people who don't like their life. They wouldn't mind things being different than they are. But that's a whole lot different than making the decision down to the core of your being that there will be change. Change begins with an act of the will, a decision that things are gonna be different. There just has to be a point in your life where you look at where you are and where you want your life to be and then decide to do it, purpose it in your heart. It's not enough to, have, to know that you need to change. It's not even enough to have the desire to change. You've gotta make up your mind, there's gonna be change. Resolve. Now, when you hit rock bottom in an area, that's often not hard to do, but that's not where most of us are. Most of us are in a kind of no man's land that wars against making this kind of serious resolve, this kind of resolution, because we look good on the outside, but we're leveraged to our eyeballs and we're just one or two missed paychecks away from absolute crisis mode. But the paychecks are coming. We're making minimum payments. Retirement seems like a million miles, you know, a million years away. And God, well, I mean, we feel bad about that every now and then, but we cope by trying not to think about it. So we give an occasional tip instead of a consistent tithe and try to shove any guilt away. But that's no man's land. And you'll never leave it naturally. And you're just one unforeseen event that'll throw you into bitter reality. So make the decision, make the declaration. You know that getting out of debt is absolutely critical. You know it is. So start off by saying, okay, this is a new year. Today the gun goes off. I am declaring war on debt. I am sick and tired of living this way. I'm gonna mark this point in my personal history where I left the insanity. I am going to make the journey to financial freedom. That declaration is first. Okay, next week, step two on this journey, and it's an important one. Until then, let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for a new year. What a wonderful time to just recalibrate and rethink and renew and get fresh vision for our lives and money matters and you know it matters and you've given us such a great roadmap to follow. And you also wanna personally help us get involved in our lives and be a part of all of our steps toward financial freedom. So Father, I just invite you in uh, to all of this and all of us and help us get your wisdom and then your help uh, to stop living the way we are financially, particularly when it's paycheck to paycheck, that's miserable for us and it saddens you because you want so much more for our lives. So I pray that this investment of time and what we have coming up in the next couple of installments will really be used by you and we'll look back on it even years later and say that changed everything. Well, I pray that in Jesus' name, amen.